Ladies and gents, welcome back to another Engineers podcast. Today I'm joined by Fred, who's tech lead at Hacken Technologies. We're going to do a bit of a deep dive into Kraken and some of the amazing stuff that they've built. I actually found Fred on LinkedIn blogging about some of the really cool stuff uh, that they've gone and built and reached out to her and she's been kind enough to come and join us. But some really cool key takeaways that we can learn about Kraken would be they've built a really interesting universal agent model, which we're going to be exploring in a little bit more detail and how that actually works. But actually the power of building modern systems and a modern engineering culture, which empowers people to have their own decisions or have their own autonomy, drive product development. And we're going to be exploring really the power of what Kraken Technologies actually do. Fred, huge thanks. Initially, huge thanks for coming back to me on LinkedIn, but no. thanks for coming to join us here. Um, for everyone listening, do you want to give us an intro into you, your background, last few years at Kraken Technologies? That's definitely going to set the scene. Of course. Um, so I'm a lead engineer at Kraken. I've been here for coming up to five and a half years now. So I'm I'm not quite OG, but I'm I'm fairly early, early <laughs> doors. There were about 20, 20 developers at the business when I joined, so still fairly early on, whereas now we're we're up yeah. to more more than five hundred, I think, globally. Um I did a physics undergrad and then I did a physics PhD. Um during that, I dabbled in tech things a little bit. So I did a an internship at Shazam in service engineering, so more the platform side, I guess you could say. And then I try, tried out data science a bit, decided it wasn't for me, and then got this job, basically. So this is my first proper full-time job um, at one company, but I haven't really, haven't really looked back. It's been, been a great, great five years. <laughs> Love it. You did your PhD. Uh, did you say server engineer? Service engineer. Service engineer. Service engineer. Yeah. At Shazam. Talk to me about that turning moment where you thought, I really like this. I want to explore, obviously, then data science, but then software engineering. What What was that moment for you where you realized this is what you want to do? Uh, I think academia is has a lot of advantages in that you're kind of in control of your work a little bit in terms of when you want to do what. So you have a lot of flexibility, but also it's quite a, I mean, people say this all the time, it's a bit of a lonely experience. And I think it's, it sometimes lacks support a little bit because by definition, you're working on something that no one else is working on because you're doing something new. And I think when I did that internship, I saw that you could have a similar environment, but with actual support and with a team to work with. Um, and just a bit more perks. So some of the things are similar, but actually just having that support and working on something a little bit more structured. Um, that I think for me was really when I when I thought, oh, maybe tech is what I want to do. But I wasn't really sure what it was in tech that I would be good at or what I wanted to do. Hence the little data science exploration. But then during um, that, I did I did this um, course, I guess, where you do a project. I actually ended up doing a software engineering project there and just really enjoyed that. So then, then I thought I should look into software engineering jobs instead. So it's it's good that I worked it out. I think I had a bit of a phase of not really not understanding what it was that I wanted to do. It does take it does take time for some people though. You know, it, in or out of academia, it does take some time. I would consider you OG, first <laughs> 20 people at uh, Cracking Technologies. Um, considering the scale of where they are now, but for people that don't know, can you almost give us that elevator pitch or intro into who are Kraken Technologies? Yeah, so Kraken Technologies um, is part of the Octopus Energy Group and we're um, a customer management and billing system in the utility sector. So initially we were just in the energy um, industry, but now we've expanded also to other utilities like water, telco, along those lines. Um, and like I said, it's it's all about the, the customer management aspect. So 
comms going out, um, all of that, but also billing, uh, taking payments, um, talking to the industry and so on. So that's kind of what we built. Um, and I think the main thing that we pride ourselves on is providing good customer service, which is partly achieved by having a platform that's nice to use for those working in customer service um, and making them more efficient um, and allowing them to do their job well, which is partly achieved by having um, one person being able to understand and work the whole kind of range of the customer lifecycle rather than having lots of specialists and so on. Um, and then by having um, that really nice platform to use, um, it just also frees up some more capacity to do more interesting things. And uh, because we're a modern software that kind of iterates, we iterate quite a lot on on the, the product that we're building. Um, and we have quite an, I like saying agile, lowercase a, agile uh, development process. Um, it just means that we can do more interesting things and we can build things quite quickly, um, try it out, see what works, make it better. So um, out of that come really interesting products, for example, in the electricity industry, um, having products that, that can um, have dynamic pricing, time of use tariffs, and then more interesting uh, integrations using some of our other Kraken products like Kraken Flex, who uh, can manage our demand um, on on the wider industry side. So there's, there's lots of interesting products that we've built, which I can talk about more, but also don't. <laughs> yeah, well, no, 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 we'll, we'll go into those. I think one takeaway for me when we were speaking initially was just how much you've seen the business grow you know 20 people to i think it's over 500 people and maintaining engineering standards was one of the first things that you pointed out as you know it, it was really impressive to do this on pretty much a global scale it'd be really good to talk about that growth of the business and how you've seen that scale and then touching on how you actually maintain some of those engineering standards across the business before we then go into a bit more about the products and stuff. I think what, what's always been good for us in the business is that our head of engineering, uh, when I started, he he's always had um, a lot of conventions, like even from the start, when, when I joined, we had public conventions that you could look at if you applied for a job, we still have those. Um, so that's always been part of the, the culture right from the start, even for a relatively small team. Um, and some of our, our conventions, our formatters, uh, formatters that we still use were introduced around the time when, when I joined um, and made things for me so much easier. Just being someone who's quite new to the industry, at least in a um, professional setting, um, it made my life so much easier. And I have I was won over, let's put it that way, um, immediately by those sorts of things. So we've always had conventions and we we just keep growing them. So the more people you have working um, on a project, and ours is a very big project, the more important it is to have those conventions and to also have some um, enforced rules, so to speak. So we use a lot of linters to make sure, let's say, if we have a problem, it doesn't get worse, or uh, to kind of enforce certain certain standards that we have. But also just having those conventions to point people to when you when you do code review, you can then link back and say, look, here's the the convention that we have. Uh, they normally explain why we have those conventions. It's not just a set of rules you have to adhere to for no reason. We actually um, have discussions on them and come to a consensus and we're not afraid to change them either if it turns out that um, it's no longer really applicable to how we work. Yeah, okay. For, for people listening, explain conventions just in a little bit more detail for me and what, what that might actually look like. So there's, I mean, it can cover a lot of different things, but it we have conventions, for example, on... Um, we have um, a module structure for where the actual application code lives. And then we have a convention to say the test structure, the, so the, the, the place where all the tests live, should mirror the application structure. And that just makes it a lot easier to find the test corresponding to the application code. That's 
one of the conventions that we have, for example, um, or uh, other conventions around how you group tests or how you name tests. Uh, they're mostly aimed at making it easier for someone new to the area, new to the code, to understand what's going on. So if you have tests that are descriptive and have names that actually tell you what it's trying to do, it's a lot easier than having a test that just says test function name. You, you, you don't know what it means. Whereas if you can put the outcome of the, in the name of your test, then that's a lot more helpful for people um, trying to work out how the code works if they're, they're coming into it for the first time. I think that's something we have to consider in general, people coming in, trying to understand what's going on because it is such a big code base. So making that easier in any way that we can, that's very important for us. I do see it a lot more common. I think especially over the last couple of years, I've spoken to a number of people on the podcast as well, whether it be playbooks, conventions, obviously documentation is key, but you know, we're, we're talking about such a rapidly growing business like yourself on a global scale. It's really difficult to be across all of those different conversations. You need to have something standardized that you really believe in that you can roll out, that people can just absorb in their own space and everyone's on the same page. I think actually the bros to a certain extent help that. For example, Did it? Uh, I would say... Uh, onboarding documentation when I joined was was okay, but it was still probably relying on someone walking you through it a bit more, which you can obviously do if you're all sitting in one office. But as you grow, you can't do that anymore. And I think we've always hired people who are super keen to make what's there better. So as we started hiring more globally, maybe the expert in a certain area or the people who are used to explaining these things were in a completely different time zone. So um, they took it on themselves to improve the documentation. So I think it's having hiring the kind of people that are really keen to also contribute to those things and who really value it, who then are super keen to contribute straight away, is also a really big part of why this has worked very well. Because part of when you start is normally improving the the documentation to start that you that you walked through when you started, because it can always be better, right? There's always something that maybe we missed out. Um, so if everyone just contributes from the start, it's, it just makes it better and better. That's actually really akin to, I, I feel like, the culture at Crack and Tech. Because, you know, offline, you and I have spoken about this relationship between developer ownership and the product and the autonomy to be able to go and make your own decisions or drive product development. So. Do you want to just talk about that in a little bit more detail and what that really looks like? Yeah, I think what's important um, for us is that as developers, we're not just um, driven by tickets written by someone else that tell you exactly what to do. But instead, um, we kind of work with product managers to work out what the thing is that we're trying to solve rather than being given a solution. And then as a developer, you would come up with a solution because you know the system best and you have more of the context, which is more and more important as we grow because we don't want to diverge everywhere where one developer is just given a solution, they implement it when actually we have something really similar already, which we could just tweak slightly to make it a bit more flexible to cover different use cases. So um, the developers kind of own the system that they build and know best how to make it better or how to extend it or when it's time to actually do something different. Um, so I think that's that's something I always say is really important because that's not how everyone works and you really want someone to know that they can have that input and they're kind of, I guess, empowered to, to do things with what they're given. Yeah. I don't have the data to back it up, but... <clears throat> a lot more companies are moving towards that mindset of you build it, you run it, you own it. And the, the quality of what you build invariably from what I hear, I don't have the data, like I said, is it is better quality. And you've spoken about driving really good customer experience. They probably go hand in hand in fairness. 
Yeah, for sure. I think it's um, you take pride in what you build, right? So um, you want it to be good. So if you if you have more, um, I guess that that ownership over it, then you would want to make sure it's it's good and it works well because <laughs> it never feels good when something you do breaks or it gets bad feedback or something. So I think if if you know it's kind of your thing that you build and you maintain, then you're more likely to build it in a in a good way. I think. Yeah, we're going to talk about this universal Kraken model in the next couple of moments. It would be really good to touch on if I was to walk into the Kraken offices, what kind of engineering challenges might I find going from team to team? What might I be exposed to? I think the the biggest challenge we probably have is our global expansion um, that that we're doing. So we we started out in the UK, but we're now operating in uh, or coming up to 10, 11, around that order of countries yeah. that we're, we're operating in. And even within that, it's different markets. So we, we always talk about markets as, um, say, the electricity market in the UK or the gas market uh, in Japan, that kind of thing. So it's even more markets than that. Um, so, for example, in the UK, we we have electricity, gas, um, and then water and telco that we're, we're operating in. And they all work in a slightly different way. And they all have slightly different conventions. So um, something we try to do is to make sure that we're, like I said earlier, not reinventing the wheel all the time, but instead build flexible products that can be adapted to suit the client or the market's needs. Um, so that we don't lose some of the success that we've had. Um, so, for example, I've done a lot of work on on what we call our customer migrations product, which is um, the process of getting new customers into Kraken, which we would do, for example, when we license the software to a new client. Obviously, the customers have to come from the previous um, the previous system into our system, and I've worked a lot on that and. Having done this process so many times, we've done so many migrations in the UK alone from so many different systems, but also globally, you get a lot of learning from that. Um, and you don't want to lose that when you go into a new market. You don't want to start over and have to make um, the same mistakes or ha have to have the same learning. So that's something that's very important to us that we uh, don't have to start over every time we, we go into a new market, but we can use what we've got that we know works well and build on that. And um, by building out new functionality that's needed in one market, maybe we have a free win of the same thing that could be really useful in a different market. Yeah. I, I see reusability being like more and more a hot topic at the moment. A lot of companies are doing it. What are some of the biggest challenges with migrations, scaling that up with customers what are some of the big challenges i think it's um first of all something that that is sometimes difficult is if you have an ongoing migration it's hard to make changes while you're in it um and we're very used to being able to make changes all the time um and by changes i mean fundamental changes actually what works well for us is that we are very flexible on how we develop and we can develop quite quickly um, which means that we can um, work quite flexibly with scaling up those migrations um, by putting customers into groups that are similar, making sure those work really well, and then we can take the time while those customer groups scale up to, to build out the new functionality. So we can make changes in that, that sense, um, but if we want to fundamentally update how we, how we do something in the whole process, it is a bit more painful. But I think actually our flexibility works really well for migrations generally um, because of that scale up and building out functionality that kind of goes hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about not just building the platform, you talk about building the operating model. Why is that powerful for some of your customers? I think Kraken is only as efficient as we want it to be if it's used in the right way. And part of what makes Kraken so good is that it's quite easy to use compared to other systems that I've seen. Um, and you don't need to have a super in-depth understanding of how everything works, but instead 
one person can can handle a customer and that's kind of how Kraken is intended to be used, which is why when we uh, license Kraken to uh, to clients, we don't just license the software, but we usually help them transform their business to use Kraken in that way um, and to work in small teams that have a customer base and to then enable them to actually provide that really good customer service and use the platform most effectively. So it kind of goes hand in hand because otherwise you're, you're not really using Kraken to... Um, to its advantage really the way the way it's intended yeah talk to me about this um not necessarily big bang but more slow scale and what that actually means or what that terminology might mean inside of kraken when you will refer to so it. i think typical custom migrations like you would do when changing platforms um work in a way where you have at least a year of of just testing um, and then migrating everyone in, in one go. Um, and that's not what we do at all. So um, what we instead do is that you try and put customers into groups of similar with similar traits. So for example, that could be um, if you're looking at the energy market, customers with smart meters um, who have an email address and uh, use their like online account a lot or it could be the opposite um customers who are very disengaged um who only receive postal letters and so on so you put customers into groups that are similar that are maybe on the same tariffs and that kind of thing um and then you try out small numbers of customers um during the migration you watch them very closely we call this hyper care where you make sure that the account wants to be migrated um functions as normal and then when you know it works for one customer in that group of customers that all have really similar attributes then you can confidently scale it up uh, quite rapidly um, and we kind of do this for multiple cohorts we call them um, and yeah. it, it just means that you can have confidence in what you're doing without spending a year just testing um, and also it means that you can kind of train up the customer service staff um, at the same time so um, you can scale your operational capacity at the same time as yeah. actually migrating the customer. So it kind of goes hand in hand and you can, you can build that up together. That's a really interesting approach. And I'm not sure if this is Kraken, like culture inside of the business is in deliberately thinking this is the best way to approach solving this problem or customer operations let's say but i think it makes quite a lot of sense um i would probably typically see a customer migration in that vein everyone gets put into the same bucket if you like and gets treated the same so really interesting to see how that that different mindsets evolve it, it definitely takes some getting used to with our clients as well so we kind of have to coach them through it a little bit um and it also means that you have to, as a as a client, you have to adapt your ways of working to match ours a little bit. Um, because, like I said, we are happy to um, introduce new features that might be needed for a customer group that we haven't yet had to support on the platform. We're happy to work on that while we start the migration, um, and then build build up that functionality as needed which is a bit of a change maybe um, for, for some yeah. of our clients who are used to more traditional ways of, um, of working. But it's, I think um, we, we get them on board and I think it, it generally works well for us and for them. Different markets, different locations. I'll call them markets and locations. Talk to me a little bit about the plan for 2024. I've seen crack and evolve massively in the last few years and for what you can say in confidence what are the plans this year for the business expand more <laughs> okay um, i think it's always um there are always plans to go into other markets and um you know new clients in the pipeline so there's definitely some some growth in that sense coming up um, but also making sure that obviously the way we work is scalable with our ambitions. So I think that's a really big focus for us at the moment. Like how can we work most effectively 
to make sure we can support that growth because that's obviously really important you don't want your um staff to like drown and and work so for, for us that's really important that everyone enjoys what they're doing and we can grow in a sustainable way from a human point of view as well yeah okay that's important talk to me about growth of the team we've got thousands of people that listen to the podcast extremely talented people that no doubt will be looking at different opportunities over the course of this year and obviously the market is the way it is talk to me a little bit about what skills or what characteristics you typically hire into the business and why so that if people are listening they can reach out to the right people at kraken and make themselves known um i think what we talked about before that being able to actually um take take a project and like run with it and take a problem and solve it um i think that's that's very important for us um people who are good at communicating with with other members of the team especially with having such a global team it's really important that we communicate well um especially like asynchronously uh, because it's you, you need to a communicate a lot you need to <laughs> make sure people know what you're working on but you also um, need to communicate in the right way you know we're we're a a friendly business and you know I mean, i'm sure a lot of people say this but we have a no blame culture so people make mistakes think things happen but we're more interested in finding a solution and trying to find a way to prevent it from happening again so um not being afraid of making mistakes and and you know being good at collaborating and, and trying to fix it and prevent it uh, i think that's that's quite important um other than that we have we have a mix you know that i think what's always worked really well is that we have people who are so different, but it works together really well. So we have some people who are really technical and are very good at um, architecting um, our, our code in a, in a good way and trying trying to find new approaches that maybe work better with how we've changed and how we've grown. But we also have a lot of people who are good at being big picture thinkers uh, or finding the connections between different problems. So it's we've, we've hired a lot of different people. Um, really and we we, t we tend to hire really good people always I love it when you hire someone and then you just think oh this person is really good I'm so glad we, yeah. we hired them so yeah what a feeling so I hear fearlessness smart different and difference in backgrounds difference in the way people think product development mindset communication if these things resonate with you or people that you want to work with you should be talking to fred maybe don't overwhelm fred but maybe overwhelm some of the people that are at kraken in talent teams people teams um, we, we have those as well they're really all very nice <laughs> good. everyone's very nice in the business mm -hmm. so there's going to be some links below here um, for people to go away and do that and I will also link the blog actually as to where you and I met Fred and people can see our comment on there that we wanted to get you on the podcast and feature you, feature Kraken, some of the amazing work that you guys are girls are doing. And just a big thank you for coming to share over the last 30 minutes with your journey, your personal journey, but also I think you're a bit of an OG um at kraken and that journey of building that business and what that actually looks like expanding into what 10 11 different countries different locations however you guys call it um, it has been fascinating and i think seeing that from an external perspective and watching you guys grow um it brings me joy that you know we're here we're here talking about it and sharing it with the community and this success has been amazing. So a big thanks. Uh, well, thank you for having me. I, I enjoy myself. Good. And for everyone liking, sharing, reposting, it's all massively, massively appreciated. And a huge thanks from everyone here at Engineers. And bye for now. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching this episode. Uh, massively appreciate you listening and checking in with us. If you want to find out more about us, 
and what we're doing, please check us out on social media. What we're trying to do at Engineers is build a community to drive knowledge sharing and experiences. On Twitter, we can be found at engineers.io, it's no underscore. We've also got a website which is engineers.io. These links will all be posted in the description. Any feedback and comments are massively appreciated. We're always looking to improve on where we can. Thanks guys.